This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. What is the difference between mere life and the good life? Aristotle once said, the good life is a life informed by the principles that express our highest ideals, life as we would like to live it. The good life is an education that rattles and decenters. Relationships, sustenance, and aspiration. A life of reflection and agency in concert with others in pursuit of collective well-being. The good life is to equate instead with a healthier public life. Pursuing knowledge, cultivating friendship, preserving freedom, satisfying needs. The good life is having a language to express your deeper thoughts, emotions, and beliefs. The good life is when students' eyes light up at the realization that their engineering work will improve other people's lives. Stay with us as some of UC San Diego's finest scholars share their pursuit of the good life. The subject of what it means to lead a good life has been in the air for millennia. Aristotle, in his Topics, 350 BC, wrote, and I quote, superfluities are better than necessities and are sometimes more desirable as well. For the good life is better than mere life, and good life is a superfluity, whereas mere life itself is a necessity. The expression superfluity applies whenever one possesses the necessities of life and sets to work to secure as well other noble acquisitions. Roughly speaking, perhaps, necessities are more desirable, while superfluities are better. The good life is the chief end, both for the community as a whole and for each of us individually. But we also come together and form and maintain political associations merely for the sake of life. For perhaps there is some element of the good even in the simple act of living. It is an evident fact that most of us cling hard enough to life to be willing to endure a good deal of suffering, which implies that life has about it a natural quality of pleasure." Unquote. So the primary conundrum resides in weighing necessities against the aspirations for something beyond mere existence. Lucretius, in his 7,000 line essay, The Nature of Things, done in approximately 54 BC, writes of the function of poetry which can make engagement with complex matters more palatable. And I intend to follow his example this evening. That is, to use the content of the arts to invoke my purposes. I see a triad of factors as essential to a life that rewards. They are relationships, parents, siblings, a life partner, friends, sustenance, those aspects of life that we need, nutrition, homeostasis, safety, as well as the resource that we consume in service to these needs. And then, of course, aspiration arising out of the experience of and taking note of the world around us and of our mental life. What is alluring about the world and calls us towards its various features? What is missing and desirable? 
what allows us to differentiate ourselves from others while yet embracing our shared humanity. The first two factors, relationships and sustenance, are unavoidable in every existence, but it is the third on which I will concentrate. We are less likely to ponder meaning or desire to create substance where it is absent if lacking relationships and sustenance. The practice of art might traffic in superfluities, but it cannot, I trust, be thought superfluous. All of us share a good fortune that is not an entitlement, but short-sighted as we are, we do in fact assume it. If I ask myself why I am a composer, my immediate thought is the empathic pleasure of music as experience. It is uniquely captivating. Other aspects of the world intrigued me, but nothing called out, almost literally, for engagement with it as music did. And I know the precise occasion upon which that first happened. I realize also that there is a need within me, a drive to do something with one's allotted time. If the pursuit of music had not gone well, I would have traveled other paths, but I was fortunate and it did go well. And I want my work to have meaning beyond its personal satisfactions, though they too are motivating. I realized early that to try to bend my creative work towards a cause, political or otherwise, led to a devaluation that was palpable. The work, when deliberately directed towards an external purpose, did not feel true as I was doing it, nor did it sound genuine in performance. I understood that I had to do what deeply engaged me and nothing other. Engagement with the world is where creative work discovers its fuel. And every project consumes something, an idea, an experience, a substance that may reside in the work of another artist or in experience itself. In our Southern California circumstance, say walking along the Pacific shore early in the morning. But the aspirational can often fold back upon the other members of the triad I cited. For instance, it is deeply satisfying to swim with others in larger currents of concern and to share rewarding experience. The particular ways in which sustenance is managed can clearly be more than mere necessity. Where and in what kinds of structures we live, what we eat and drink, the nourishment we share, all this is woven into the fabric of a life that feels worthy. Before plunging in, a word of explanation about my title. The lineage of Lucretius's epic statement is extraordinary. The Greek philosopher Epicurus, born in 341 BC, examined the place of pleasure in life. His influence persisted over three centuries and became the subject for the Roman Lucretius's monumental, The Nature of Things. In subsequent centuries, this work fell into obscurity and was only brought again to influence through the persistence of a papal secretary deposed named Poggio in the 15th century. Harvard's Stephen Greenblatt has provided a detailed history of the re-emergence of Lucretius's work and of its subsequent influence on the Renaissance in his 2011 book, The Swerve. When presented with the theme of this lecture series, my thought was to share, to let the voices of those who had spoken to me now speak to you. I reread Lucretius, Michael Ondaatje, Emily Dickinson, John Ashbury, Milan Kundera, Richard Wilbur, 
Roberto Bolaño, Daisetsu Suzuki, and took note of their implications. What emerged suggested another, an aspirational lineage, this one in five stages, from truth through secrets, boundaries, and purpose to metaphoric flight. I'll trace this succession in my talk as it arises in the writing of those whom I quote. There will simultaneously be sounds and images that have mattered to me. I'll talk in short about the origins of what we can aspire to when the basics have been cared for. Time assuages. Time never did assuage. And actual suffering strengthens as sinews do with age. Time is a test of trouble, but not a remedy. If such it proved, it proved too, there was no malady. Now, pay attention to what follows and prick up your ears. Nor does it escape me how obscure this all appears. But the goad of hoped-for glory strikes my spirit to inspire, and at the selfsame moment smites my heart with sweet desire for muses stirring up my thoughts. My mind abuzz, I blaze new trails across their mountain haunts among untrodden ways. I thrill to come upon untasted springs and slake my thirst. I joy to pluck strange flowers for a glorious wreath, the first whose brow the muses ever crowned with blossoms from this spot. Why? Because I teach great truths. What bracing verve comes through in A.E. Stallings' superb translation? His time, Lucretius's, feels innocent for ours when the proliferation of new directions open to one can leave us confused and indecisive. Our own view of truths in an academic context, whether they can be said to exist, whether they can be taught, is hardly settled. And artists, of course, ask themselves what their work can reveal. Michael Ondaatje's novel, Anil's Ghost, is a stunning amalgam of poetic abundance with terrorism and forensic pathology. In her years abroad, during her European and North American education, Anil had courted foreignness, was at ease, whether on the Bakerloo line or the highways around Santa Fe. She felt completed abroad, even now, her brain held the area codes of Denver and Portland, and she had come to expect clearly marked roads to the source of most mysteries. Information could always be clarified and acted upon, but here, on this island, she realized she was moving with only one arm of language, among uncertain laws and a fear that was everywhere. There was less to hold on to with that one arm. Truth bounced between gossip and vengeance. Rumor slipped into every car and barbershop. Information was made public with diversions and subtexts, as if the truth would not be of interest when given directly. Here, Ondaatje's art is only slightly elevating. He offers an objective sharing leading along clearly marked roads. What we assume, a civil society, rational behavior, is clouded with diversions and subtexts, obliterated by other unimagined convictions. He portrays relationships and, as he does, the perspectives of art joust in a subdued exchange with the perils in the Sri Lankan world that he depicts. I don't think clarity is necessarily truth. 
It's simplicity, isn't it? I need to know what you think. I need to break things apart to know where someone came from. That's also an acceptance of complexity. Secrets turn powerless in the open air. Political secrets are not powerless in any form. But the tension and danger around them, one can make them evaporate. You're an archaeologist. Truth comes finally into the light. It's in the bones and... Seven. It's in character and nuance and mood. That is what governs us in our lives. That's not the truth. For the living, it is the truth. Why did you get into such a business? I love history, the intimacy of entering all those landscapes, like entering a dream. Someone nudges a stone away, and there's a story. A secret. Yes, a secret. We do, sometimes, break things apart to know their nature. But will this knowing arise as a result of bones and sediment, or rather as nuance and mood? Indeed, it's faster, it is plain, for something to be broken down than to be made again. And there will be a lot of disrupted continuity this evening of breaking apart and also emerging, as in the provocative work of the 16th century Mannerist painter Parmigianino, experienced by John Ashbery. Vasari says, Francesco, one day, set himself to take his own portrait, looking at himself for that purpose in a convex mirror, such as is used by barbers. He accordingly caused a ball of wood to be made by a turner, and having divided it in half and brought it to the size of the mirror, he set himself with great art to copy all that he saw in the glass, chiefly his reflection, of which the portrait is the reflection once removed. The glass chose to reflect only what he saw, which was enough for his purpose, his image, glazed, embalmed, projected at a 180 degree angle. The time of day, or the density of the light adhering to the face, keeps it lively and intact in a recurring wave of arrival. Ashbury notes the right hand bigger than the head, suggesting a swimming toward and away. A response becomes the subject. The soul establishes itself. But how far can it swim out through the eyes and still return safely to its nest? The surface of the mirror being convex, the distance increases significantly. That is, enough to make the point that the soul is a captive, treated humanely, kept in suspension, 
unable to advance much farther than your look as it intercepts the picture. Note this. Our act of looking intercepts the image of the remote artist's soul that can swim out through his eyes, curtails its swimming, rendering it captive. The soul has to stay where Even it is. Even though restless, hearing drops at the pane, the sighing of autumn leaves thrashed by the wind, longing to be free outside. But it must stay posing in this place. It must move as little as possible. Now Ashbury provides some elaboration to explicate his intention. This is what the portrait says. But there is in that gaze a combination of tenderness, amusement, and regret, so powerful in its restraint that one cannot look for long. The secret is too plain. And after this faint comes the metaphoric kill. That the soul is not a soul, has no secret, is small, and it fits its hollow perfectly. It's room. room, our moment of attention. That is the tune, but there are no words. The words are only speculation from the Latin speculum mirror. They seek and cannot find the meaning of the music. We're told the artistic soul harbors no secrets. It has or is a tune, but there are no words, so we cannot find the music's meaning. Kundera is also skeptical. Between the approximation of an idea and the precision of reality, there is a small gap of the unimaginable, he says. Such gaps call to an artist. What is unique about the eye hides itself exactly in what is unimaginable about a person. All we are able to imagine is what makes everyone like everyone else, what people have in common. The individual eye is what differs from the common stock, that is, what cannot be guessed at or calculated, what must be unveiled, uncovered, conquered. Kundera addresses what cannot be guessed at. Are such differences from the common stock secreted by us? Are they the inevitable attributes of individuation? How to penetrate the perplexities of existence? Ashbury is glum, Kundera ironic. Well, let's consult Dickinson again. Then an alternative view of human helplessness from Zen Buddhist Dai Set Suzuki, who sees- A man may make a remark in itself a queer thing, that may furnish the fuse unto a spark in dormant nature lane. Let us divide with skill. Let us discourse with care. Powder exists in charcoal before it exists in fire. The principle of Zen methodology is this. Whatever art or knowledge a man gets by an external means is not his own, does not intrinsically belong to him. It is only those things evolved out of his inner being that he can claim as truly his own. And his inner being opens up its deep secrets only when he has exhausted everything belonging to his intellect or his conscious deliberations. It is true that genius is born and not made. But it will never be brought out fully unless it goes through stages of serious, severe disciplining. The Zen genius sleeps in every one of us and demands an awakening. This awakening is Satori. Generally speaking, Satori breaks out when a man is at the end 
of his resources. He is sure to have a feeling of uneasiness owing to something in his unconscious, which is now disquietingly trying to move out into the open area of consciousness. Suzuki, too, perceives the soul and knowledge as limited. And he also recognizes the gap between the external and the internal. He argues not that we break apart and ponder, but that we abandon such pursuits to a discipline that embraces our limitations and does not struggle to master. To attain awakening, satori, one must recognize his feeling of uneasiness over our undeniable incompleteness. There are evidently boundaries that every aspirant must address. Lucretius examines pleasure and satisfactions that go beyond sustenance, but he recognizes that they too are bounded. Man doesn't realize that even having has its measure. There's a point beyond which nothing can increase our real pleasure. And this is what has by degrees dragged life so far from shore and stirred up from the very depths the tidal waves of war. But it was the shining sun and moon, the watchmen of the world, that as they made their rounds and quarters of the heavens swirled, taught mankind with the cycling of the year there is a reason, an order for all things, and for all things a certain season. And such diversions, of course, are not only climatological. They are inevitably stamped upon the courses of our lives. While people are fairly young, and the musical composition of their lives is still in its opening bars, they can go about writing it together and exchange motifs. But if they meet when they are older and their musical compositions are more or less complete, every motif, every object, every word means something different to each of them. In fact, a limit's set to how much each thing grows, according to its kind, since there's a limit to its span of life, and since what each thing cannot do and what it can is governed by the laws of nature. Since each species stays true to type, so true each different kind of bird displays down through the generations the marks belonging to its name. Each also must contain material that stays the same. For if the atoms could be overthrown and made to change, what could or could not come to be would be unsure. The range of possibilities would have no deep-set boundary stone. Nor could the generations so often take after their own, repeating their parents' nature, behavior, mode of life and motion. Lucretius aims to account for every thing, but questions continue to arise for questioning emblematizes human existence. And for his part, Kundera would have us believe that the only truly serious questions are ones that even a child can formulate. Only the most naive of questions are truly serious. They are the questions with no answers. A question with no answer is a barrier that cannot be breached. In other words, it is questions with no answers that set the limit of human possibilities, describe the boundaries of human existence. Kundera's questions with no answers simulate Zen koans which flummox the intellect. They set the limits. They describe our boundedness and resist aspirations. But questioning and answering are the bedrock of communication, of getting to the bottom of things or of 
failing to... It seems like a very hostile universe. But as the principle of each individual thing is hostile to, exists at the expense of all the others, as philosophers have often pointed out, at least this thing, the mute, undivided present, has the justification of logic, which, in this instance, isn't a bad thing, or wouldn't be, if the way of telling didn't somehow intrude, twisting the end result into a caricature of itself. This always happens. As in the game where a whispered phrase passed around the room ends up as something completely different. It is the principle that makes works of art so unlike what the artist intended. Often, he finds he has omitted the thing he started out to say in the first place. Seduced by flowers, explicit pleasures, he blames himself, though secretly satisfied with the result. Imagining he had a say in the matter and exercised an option of which he was hardly conscious. The way of telling intrudes. The artist in Ashbury's view is a well-meaning but ultimately inept conjurer, going indeed somewhere, but deceiving herself about the whereness. The artist, according to him, is unaware that necessity circumvents such resolution so as to create something new for itself, that there is no other way, that the history of creation proceeds according to stringent laws, and that things do get done in this way, but never the things we set out to accomplish and wanted so desperately to see come into being. But if you'd steer your life by a philosophy that's true, the way to be the wealthiest of men is to eschew high living and be contented in the mind, for there has never been a poverty of modest means. People yearned, however, to be renowned and to be powerful. That way, they thought they built their fortunes upon solid ground, but all for naught. Since as men clawed to the pinnacle of office, all the time they strewed their path with perils, and at the apex of their climb, often envy would blast them with a thunderbolt to fell them with disdain and hurl them in the pit of hateful hell. And since, like lightning, envy loves to singe the summit's best and anything that raises itself up higher than the rest, it is far preferable to live in peace and to obey than to wish to reign in power and hold, hold kingdoms in your sway. So it is the wrong sort of aspirations, Lucretius says, that are perilous, not seeking in and of itself. Let others wear themselves out all for nothing, sweating blood, battling their way along ambition's narrow road because their wisdom smacks of others' lips and they pursue things that they only know at second hand rather than through their own senses. For their way of life is just as wrong today as it will be tomorrow and has been all along. The Roman argues against wearing oneself out in pursuit of things you only know at second hand rather than through your own senses. And this recalls Suzuki's admonition that it is only those things that evolved out of his inner being that one can claim as truly his own. There is apparently room for more than one valuation of life, one set of aims. Lucretius grants the contentments of sustenance alone in noting that there has never been a poverty of modest means, and aping naturalness may be the first step towards achieving an inner calm, but it is the first step only. 
and often remains a frozen gesture of welcome etched on the air materializing behind it, a convention. And we really have no time for these except to use them for kindling. The sooner they are burnt up, the better for the roles we have to play. Facing the barriers of ignorance and incapacity, we risk falling onto a cold bed of conventions or frozen gestures. But if the community of artists must eschew the comforts of conventionality, what is the place of the direct of clear communications? Anyone who's goals, something higher must expect to suffer. So art or philosophy would seem at best risky paths. Yes, and lures us. It is the desire to fall against which, terrified, we defend ourselves. Can proximity cause vertigo? Perhaps aiming slightly lower, admitting a whiff of pragmatism might be more productive. Since those who've never tasted of it think this philosophy is a bitter pill to swallow, and the throng recoils, I wish to quote this physic in mellifluous song, to kiss it, as it were, with the sweet honey of the muse. That is the purpose of my poetry. As you peruse my lines, to try to keep your mind's attention while you start to understand the framework at the universe's heart. You're missing your name of shadow, though there are plenty of ways to Lucretius tenderizes what's tough. Not small matters, but the universe's heart. That should be momentous enough. And there is always room for artifice within the space of art. Ashbury quotes Shakespeare's Imogen, applying it to Mahler's Ninth Symphony. There cannot be a pinch in death more sharp than this. His artful manifestation carries the momentum of a conviction that had been building. Mere forgetfulness cannot remove it, nor wishing bring it back. As long as it remains the white precipitate of its dream in the climate of sighs flung across our world, a cloth over a birdcage. But it is certain that what is beautiful seems so only in relation to a specific life experienced or not, channeled I stepped into from some plank form. To plank, a slow and cautious way. The stars above my head I felt about my feet, the sea. I knew not, but the next would be my final inch. This gave me that precarious gait some call experience. Just before Dickinson's epigrammatic revelation, we had a guarded affirmation from Ashbury that beauty is to be found formed in specific lives. But he immediately recolors his perspective by adding that the form into which beauty is channeled is steeped in the nostalgia of a collective past. And again, it's faster, it is plain, to be broken down than to be made again. And yet, nevertheless, the look somewhere as a sign makes one want to push forward, ignoring the apparent naivete of the attempt, not caring that no one is listening, since the light has been lit once and for all in their eyes and is present, unimpaired, a permanent anomaly, awake and silent. 
Ashbury's writing of light makes me think of windows, allowing the light to enter, our gaze to depart. The cloth over the birdcage curtails our dreaming, but now lit up and awake, we experience day's light and find that this nondescript, never to be defined daytime is the secret of where it takes place and we can no longer return to the various conflicting statements gathered, lapses of memory of the principal witnesses. All we know is that we are a little early, that today has the special lapidary todayness that the sunlight reproduces faithfully in casting twig shadows on blithe sidewalks. No previous day could have been like this. This day, our now. The immediacy of awareness shifts our perspective away from the lapses in irrationality inherent in dreams. Still, dreaming cannot be written off. Dreaming is not merely an act of communication or coded communication, if you like. It is also an aesthetic activity, a game of the imagination, a game that is a value in itself. Our dreams prove that to imagine, to dream about things that have not happened is among mankind's deepest needs. Let's move toward need now, to an intersection in the realm of relationships, an interface between the soul's secrets and the honey of the muses. He just drinks and sings. It's called The Writer. In her room at the prow of the house, <clears throat> where light breaks and the windows are tossed with linden, my daughter is writing a story. I pause in the stairwell, hearing from her shut door a commotion of typewriter keys like a chain hauled over a gunnel. Young as she is, the stuff of her life is a great cargo and some of it heavy, I wish her a lucky passage. But now it is she who pauses, as if to reject my thought and its easy figure. A stillness greatens in which the whole house seems to be thinking. And then she is at it again with a bunched clamor of strokes and again is silent. I remember the dazed starling was trapped in that very room two years ago. I was so lame, I wish she had brought me a tutor and not a dead body. I was so lame, I wish I had brought a dead body It is always a matter, my darling, of life or death, as I had forgotten. I wish what I wished you before, but harder. Here, once again with the clearing of the sill of the world, we are offered an allegorical reference to flight. The potential of what's wild and striving. Ashbury's no previous day would have been like this preceded Richard Wilbur's sill clearing. In the first case, flight is a consciousness happening, then reported. Wilbur's starling manifests purpose to find its necessary light. His poem engages the reader with potential and awareness. It almost coerces us into emotional vulnerability and empathy. 
art, artful ways of telling, can pry us open to engagement with the appalling or with the simple and enchanting. There was a small pool cut into the floor for floating flowers. It was a luxury to her, something to confuse a thief in the dark. At night, returning from work, Anil would slip out of her sandals and stand in the shallow water, her toes among the white petals, her arms folded as she undressed the day, removing layers of events and incidents so they would no longer be within her. She would stand there for a while, then walk wet-footed to bed. Michael Ondaatje's novels swing on fiction's rope. They launch into a flight of myth and are caught up once more in agile narrative hands. Like trapeze artists, they fly from one arm-straining gravity to another across a shocking gap of weightlessness. His heroes are adepts of reality and backlit in legend. They are, all of them, workers. Work for the night is coming goes an old hymn. For Andace, work fills and fights the night. Craft, in the widest sense, art, perhaps, or labor's skill or a scientist's devotion, is illumination in the darkness of a world blood-drenched and fed on abstractions. Ondace's craftsmen rise to the miraculous. Ashbury uses poetic language to transmute the impact of an image into an idea. And then in his characteristically remote manner, he ambles with us along intriguing paths of influence and associations. Milan Kundera references rather music as gateway or perhaps window. He writes that music is the art that comes closest to Dionysian beauty and the sense of intoxication. No one can really get drunk on a novel or a painting, but who can help getting drunk on Beethoven's Ninth, Bartok's Sonata for two pianos and percussion, or the Beatles' White Album? He considered music a liberating force. It liberated him from loneliness, introversion, dust of the library, 
It opened the door of his body and allowed his soul to step out into the world to make friends. Kundera illuminates Ashbury's secret soul, but not with Ashbury's light. Kundera's soul steps out into the world just as Suzuki's uneasiness tried to move out into our consciousness. I revel at the diversity of art's transformative ways. This is the center of the artist's aspiration. Even if she is glum or cynical, even if his approach feels disconcertingly exuberant. The prizes of life and absolutely everything that's fine, poetry, painting, statues cunningly wrought and made to shine by trial and error and probing restless intellect day by day, step by step, these skills were taught to man, feeling his way. So, incrementally, time brings all things within our sight and reason lifts them up into the boundaries of light for men saw one thing after another clearly in their hearts till they ascended to the very summit of the arts. Now, there's another liftoff close, flight, as Lucretius brings his monumental poem to an end. We've covered a lot of ground, perhaps broken apart and shifted perspective a bit much. In any case, here now are two closing passages contrived to show the lifting up that art can bring us by metaphor, by argument. Is there anything to be serious about beyond this otherness that gets included in the most ordinary forms of daily activity, changing everything slightly and profoundly and tearing the matter of creation, any creation, not just artistic creation, out of our hands to install it on some monstrous near peak too close to ignore too far for one to intervene. This otherness, this not being us, is all there is to look at in the mirror, though no one can say how it came to be that way. A ship flying unknown colors has entered the harbor. Now, I need your full attention here. A revolutionary thing strives hard to reach your ear. A new side of the universe struggles to come to light, for no fact is so simple we believe it at first sight. And there is nothing that exists so great or marvelous that over time mankind does not admire it less and less. Behold the pure blue of the heavens, and all that they possess, the roving stars, the moon, the sun's light, brilliant and sublime. Imagine if these were shown to men now for the first time, suddenly and with no warning. What could be declared more wondrous than these miracles no one before had dared believe could even exist? Nothing. Nothing could be quite as remarkable as this. So wonderful would be the sight. Wishes to fall down now, however, in front of everybody. people hardly bother to lift their Wishes eyes to, to the glittering down. heavens. They are so Fall accustomed to the skies. That's why you should let go of any terror of the new. But don't spit out my reason. Weigh with care. If it seems true what I'm about to say, then throw your hands up and surrender. But if it should seem false, then arm yourself as truth's defender. The mind seeks explanation. Since the universe extends forever out beyond those ramparts at which our world ends, the mind forever yearns to peer into infinity, to project beyond and outside of itself and there soar free.
So we've just seen dance from the perspective of an observer outside. Now manifested in words, the soaring of the mind embodied. Here is a final passage from Michael Ondaatje's magical and horrific novel, Anil's Ghost, describing dance as felt from within. It is wondrous music to dance alongside. She has danced to it with others on occasions of joy and gregariousness, carousing through a party with it. It seemed all her energy on her skin. But this now is not a dance, does not contain even a remnant of the courtesy or sharing that is part of a dance. She is waking every muscle in herself, blindfolding every rule she lives by, giving every mental skill she has to the movement of her body. Only this will lift her backward into the air and pivot her hip to send her feet over her. A scarf tied tight around her head holds the earphones to her. She needs music to push her into extremities and grace. She wants grace, and it happens here only on these mornings or after a late afternoon downpour when the air is light and cool, when there is also the danger of skidding on wet leaves. It feels as if she could eject herself out of her body like an arrow. <laughs>